So they fly up there, and sure enough, the intelligence was right on the money. They start getting fighter aircraft shooting at them as they approach the target, and then an aircraft fire or AA comes up from underneath. Harley is the upper turret gunner on top of the plane. And he's looking for fighter jets, fighter planes coming at him. They weren't jets, they were, these are propeller airplanes. And here comes a fighter airplane right at him. They're shooting right at each other, head on. Harley's shooting at the plane, the plane's shooting back. And a bullet just, just misses him, breaks the plexiglass cover, jams up his gun, it shatters his uh, goggles, gets a bloody nose out of it. A fragment of that, that bullet entered his, fly, his flight suit, but luckily the flight suit's probably about an inch thick because it's very cold up there, and it stops the, stops the fragment from hitting him. So the gun is jammed. He climbs down from his turret into the belly of the airplane, and he looks ahead and he sees the, the pilot doing the same thing. The pilot is unbuckling his, his uh, safety belts and he's walking out to see what happened and they smell gasoline. The anti-aircraft an fire or the fighter plane punctured the tanks. The plane is now full of gas. So he motions to the, to the, to the pilot, I'm doing this. And the pilot goes, go right ahead. And Harley is out of the plane or not Harvey, Harvey, he bails out. Right behind him, another guy is starting to bail out, and the airplane explodes. And luckily they were, they didn't have life vests on to save him from the water. So they're right on the edge of the Aegean Sea and the shore. Harley, you can look down and you can see the, the beach. You can also see a patrol boat below him. Already the, the Germans are on them already. They're looking for the guy that went straight down. The guy behind him was able to bail out, but he went, his parachute didn't open, and he fell right under the water, maybe like a mile down, 5,000 feet down. So within minutes, when he lands, he lands his parachute on the beach, takes the parachute off, tries to hide it. Already the Germans have got him. They put him in the boat. And they go out a you know, mile away and they find this downed airman. And Harley didn't know who it was. Well, not Harley, I'm, excuse me, this is Harvey. Harvey didn't know who it was. But as soon as they pull him out of the water, it's a co-pilot. Co-pilot died in that crash. He's the only one that survives. Two days later, after interrogation, he's on a, on a train heading north through the Alps, through Austria, into Germany. So now, he's a prisoner of war. And he's at a place called uh, Hammerstein Camp 2B, Stalag 2B. That camp has got a terrible history. Prisoners are shot routinely and the excuse was, oh, they're trying to escape, they're trying to get, trying to get away. They think the, the, the Gestapo are just trying to eliminate American prisoners. So eventually, in January 1945, the Russians are coming. The Russians are pushing from the east through the Ukraine, through Poland, and this camp is in present-day Poland. They're at way out in east, east of Germany in the, in, the, in the Poland. They can already see at night flashes of explosions from bombs and, and artillery. And occasionally they can hear the rumbling from artillery going off 10, 15 miles away. So what do the Germans do? Instead of saying, I l we'll let you guys go, they evacuate the camp. This is January. 1945, the, one of the coldest winters in the recent history in Germany. They're not dressed to be out in the cold. Germans march them westward, 10 to 15 miles a day. 
Many times they sleep outside in the snow, huddle close together for, for heat. Many of these guys get frostbite, they lose their toes, they lose their, their, their ankles and feet and get their legs cut off and everything at field hospitals. A lot of them don't make it. Further on, after this goes on for three months of marching 10 to 15 miles a day, so they're well into Germany by now, well, almost approaching Holland. Well, the Americans are coming from Holland. Along the way, these guys are, are farmed out for uh, labor, work on an airfield, work on a road, whatever. So there's a group of guys, I don't know if, if uh, Harvey was involved with this, but they're working on a, an airfield, and here comes an American fighter plane strafing the airfield. And there's the prisoners out there working. Dozen more get killed. So they, some of them got killed at the camp, some of them died along the way, some of them died working on the airfield. So eventually, a week later, he's, he's rescued by the Americans. So, the, so this didn't just happen to this camp. It happened to all the camps in East part of Germany or in Poland. They all were evacuated. They all had to march. And some of these camps, not the one that Harvey was at, they're called the German Death March. So we had a death march in Japan. The, ger the, the prisoners called this the German Death March because some of these marches were longer and they went further and more men got sick and more gangrene and more amputations and more people died along the way. It was a horrible experience for him. Next man, Ralph Gann. If you look at this chart I have, the uh, fourth column over is school years. And you look down there and it says Ralph Gann had 11. And this is from the 1940 census and it's also from the enlistment records. It gives the, gives the education for all these young guys. These are all average guys. Most of them are farmers. So he's got 11 years. He's got high school plus three years. But you look over to the next couple columns. It says first lieutenant. So here I talk to, to Dave. What do you think, Dave? This guy only had three years of high school. He ends up as a first lieutenant. In the 1940 census, I found his census. He was born in Oklahoma, ends up in New York by himself. He's listed as a farm laborer in the census. Could this man have had a very sharp mind, good leadership quality? Could he have gotten a field commission to be a first lieutenant, in your opinion? I suspect that's what happened to him. But he got captured. He ended up in another POW camp. He escapes. I, mentioned, I didn't mention that, that Harvey tried to escape three times, got captured three times. The fourth time he went east and he was rescued by the Russians. Apparently the Germans were more afraid of the Russians than they were of the Americans. So Harvey went east and Ralph went east. So both of these men, Harvey and Ralph, were rescued by the Russians. They got them on a train down to Odessa in the Ukraine along the Black Sea, or the Caspian Sea. And they got on a freighter and they headed to Italy and rescued by the Americans there. Have you read Harvey's book? I forgot to bring my copy of it. Uh, <laughs> I have a... I have a, I bought his book just a month ago, read it within a day or two. I forgot to bring it with me. I was going to have it, pass it out, and I didn't do it. But yes, Harvey, Harvey Gann wrote a book called Escape I Must, and he did. Yeah. He did That's make it. Book. What happened to him, though, when he got back to the States, he said, look, I was a prisoner of war from you know certain time to certain time. There's so many days multiplied by a certain pay. They go like... No, 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 no. When you escaped, you were not under the control of the enemy. So he escaped four times. So they deducted that four times escaping 
from his back pay. <laughs> All right, we get toward the end here now. I'm not going to run out of time. Ivan Gan. Ivan and Carl were possibly at the same slave labor camp in uh, Hasakura. Hasakura is a mine district north of Sendai, which is way north of Tokyo, up in the mountains. And this agrees with the National Archives. They say that he was at a different camp. Manzel's list has them at the same, the same location. Charles Gan served in the army during the Korean War. That means he survived being a prisoner and he had enough guts to go back and fight again in the Korean War. Clifford Gan, he's one of the guys not shown on the National Archives list on the other page. He was interviewed here in 2004, I think the date is, by a young girl. I think I have, on a couple of sheets I have her name on there. I've modified this a little bit. She's a high school girl. She interviewed him. The interview should have lasted 53 minutes. But after 20 minutes, the video just disappears. So he's the guy that I'm missing the date captured and the date released. And I was hoping to see that in the video. So if you're interested, you know, go to the, go to the uh, Library of Congress website and search for his name, and it will show up there. So, got a few minutes left here. I want to cover the three men from Arkansas. On this list, number one on the list is Arville Douglas Gann. I don't find him at all in the census. He was born in 1917, so he should show up in 1920, 1930, 1940. Nothing. Look for his father, named Fate, F-A-T-E or F-A-Y-T-E. Couldn't find it. With, Gar with Gary's uh, recommendations, I looked for Lafayette. Couldn't find it. I looked under Douglas. Nothing. Look for his mother's name. Nothing. This guy didn't exist until 1940. I have his 1940 draft registration. And he lists his, his address as Rural Route or General Delivery Tupelo, which is about 100 miles north, northeast of here, near Newport. So he enters the Army in 1942. He's captured in 1944. I don't know where he was captured, but I'm, a, I'm assuming probably Italy, okay? Again, the same thing. Traveled by train north, ends up in a POW camp, Stalag 2B, Hammerstein. He's released in 1945. He returns to Arkansas and marries Rachel Morrison, residing in McCroy. McCroy is south of, of Tupelo, and he spends the remainder of his life farming. His last residence is the town of Diaz. We went, we drove through, my wife and I drove through that on the way down here, off 67. And in 2002, he came here to Little Rock, was, was feeling ill, he died. He's buried at the Sand Hill Cemetery near Avarinj, I guess is the name of that place. We stopped there on the way down, and I don't know if you know, but when you go to an unknown cemetery you've never been to before, you have no idea where somebody's going to get buried. It might take you an hour of looking around, and you may give up. I got lucky. Within five minutes, I found Arvel's grave. Took a picture of it, and I'm going to put that picture on Find a Grave website. There's a conflict on his Find a Grave obituary. It says here, I've got here, they list a place called Raven Den, Arkansas, which is even further north. It's up near the Missouri border. But his 1971 Social Security claim form found on Ancestry says, nope, he was born in Beattyville. Beattyville is only a couple miles away from Tupelo, five miles away from where he's buried today at the Sand Hill Cemetery. So I, again, there's a conflict there. Gilbert Gann, another man from Oklahoma, 
So now we know he's, he's born in Oklahoma. I found him in the census there, Kiefer, Oklahoma. Keeper. He moves to Arkansas at an early age. I don't know when. He shows up in the 1930-1940 census. 1935, he marries Irene Bennett in Eureka Springs, which is way up in the northwest corner of the state. He's captured in Germany, probably in Germany, because by this time already D-Day had occurred in June 1944. This is November. Ends up at Stalag 3C in Alt, Derivitz, Brandenburg, Prussia. Again, Prussia, it's a camp in the eastern part of the territories of Germany up until the end of World War II. Makes it back home, returns to Arkansas. He dies here. He's buried at Rambo Cemetery in, in Benton County. Again, that's way up in the northwest corner. Ivan Paul Gann, born in December 19, or 1915, Arkansas. He's in the 1920 census, Washington County. Again, that's way up northwest. It's just south of Benton County. So one county is the far north corner. This county is right southern, southern part of that. Enters the Army. He's in the Coastal Artillery Corps. And that was a big thing back in the early 1900s. You may not know this, but with the, uh, the era of the big battleships, with the big guns. The Army's worried about those big guns coming close to the shore and bombarding the big cities. So the Coastal Artillery Corps was created and they put in gun emplacements from Boston all the way down Florida, probably the Gulf Coast. I know they put them on California, on the west coast of California, in Hawaii. I, I was there in 2003 and visited a museum where they had one of these big gun, 14 inch, it's a 14 inch gun, single barrel. The gun actually comes up, fires, and hydraulics bring the barrel back down again where they reload it again, come, pop back up again, fire again. They have a movie about that. So they also had the same big guns in the Philippines and in Panama to protect our American interests. So these big guns were on Corregidor Island they were on a place called Drum Island, and there's a place called Fort Island and another fourth island there that protect the entrance to Manila Bay in the Philippines and along the west coast up near um, Olanganco Bay, Olanganco Naval Base, I forget the bay, up along the west coast of uh, the main island in the Philippines. So Ivan was on a gun crew manning these huge guns. The military planners back in the early, early 1900s never envisioned an invasion from Bataan. They thought it would come from the sea. So these guns, most of the big guns were aimed westward, west, northwest, southwest, not north toward Bataan. That's where the Japanese are coming from. So when the Japanese invaded, they brought their troops down, Bataan Peninsula, they captured the American forces, forced them out in the Bataan Death March, and as soon as they were out of the way, the Japanese army brought in their big artillery. And now they start bombarding Corregidor Island where Ivan is. And another guy, Carl, Carl Gann is also there. And it, it is a very intense bombardment for one week, 24 hours a day, one shell every 10 seconds. Now can you imagine, like seeing the movies, you're inside a, a, a tunnel and there's dust coming down whenever the shell hits and the lights are flickering and you're, you're, you're praying that it doesn't come through the ceiling every 10 seconds. Six times a minute there's a shell coming in for one solid week. The last week, or the first week in May, is the most intense part of this. Finally, Japanese land, barges full of troops with some tanks, and within a couple days they take over Corregidor. So now Corregidor falls to the Japanese. They've already got Bataan, now they got Corregidor. <clears throat> 